Xbox On. Welcome to Xbox On, a podcast with one host about one console, Xbox. I'm said host, Jesse DeRosa, and on today's episode, we'll be talking about the latest Xbox news for the week of July 20th, 2023, including... The Activision deal seems all but done as Microsoft irons some details out with the UK regulators. Xbox Live is officially dead, replaced by a new Game Pass tier. Fable has lost its narrative lead, and more. On this day in Xbox history, in the year 2011, 12 years ago, Bastion was released for the Xbox 360. Developed by Supergiant, of course, the guys most recently famous for Hades. Uh, this was a popular Xbox Live Arcade, one of the big Xbox Live Arcade games. Back in the day, action role-playing title. Never played Bastion. I know it's like sacrilege. It's one of those games you got to play, but honestly, nothing from Supergiant I've really ever played. I tried Hades for a little bit, but that's not enough to really say I played it. But yeah, I know people love this game. It's a it's a classic Xbox 360 era title that people are nostalgic for. But uh, shout out to you. You're 12 years old today, Bastion. You're old enough to be in middle school. Congratulations. Guys, welcome to Xbox on episode 216 of the show. We've got a lot of... It just feels like... I don't know. This week feels like the weight off my shoulders that I was kind of hoping last week would have been for Xbox. Where it's like... You know, not everything's said and done with the Activision deal, but it's kind of like we're past the worst of it. I know, like, I know for some people it's like, you know, based on the news we're going to get into today, it's like, oh, my God, we're going to have to deal with this for even longer. But I feel like we're at the point where basically most of this, most of the difficult stuff's over. Most of the daunting part of it is over. We're just kind of waiting for the uh, back channel stuff to kind of happen, and then it'll be a done deal. So the important thing is it won't be much longer before we don't have to talk about this and what we can talk about more regularly once again is everything else happening in the world of xbox which i'm really excited for really looking forward to so i'm feeling pretty optimistic about the future in that regard guys let's start with our podcast this week with a couple of opening segments as we do each and every week usually we go through the notable games releasing this week there is no big game so to speak that's coming out this week that i just got to make sure you're aware of so nothing to say there but as far as the activision update since so much of the main news segment this this week is based around this activision story we will just put a, a little uh, a little quick one here that we we don't need to get into which is just regarding that other lawsuit that's happening from that that group of gamers who are trying to sue my, or who are trying to appeal to the Supreme Court to block the Microsoft deal, you know, separate from the regulators, the FTC and the CMA and all that. Uh, there's that that group in California of, of gamers who are trying to block the deal on claims that it's uh, that it's not good for competition, it's not good for consumers. Uh, well, this week the U.S. Supreme Court have officially denied a request for that group to basically hear their request and and denied denied anything about that. So Supreme Court Justice Elena Kagan decided that the emergency request filed previously a week ago, seemingly in a last ditch effort to block the deal, has uh, has been denied. So it's not going to happen. So that one, which I don't think anyone really believed there was any weight or gravity to, is basically nipped in the bud, dead. It's over. And I, and I don't mean that to be like, oh, those guys are so lame, they never stood a chance, how, how silly of them to try and fight this. I, I respect and commend a group of people who feel passionately about something and, and want to see change, and so they go after and fight for something. So I, I, I have that respect for that group of people, and I have my concerns and doubts about this deal too, so I don't, I don't begrudge this group for fighting against this, but I think we all know there's probably never really much of a fighting chance, although I do admire their, 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 uh, their efforts and their you know, where their hearts and heads are at. So that's cool. But that, that deal is over. So we don't have to talk about that anymore. It's basically just down to the CMA at this point. And we'll get into all that in the news, including the, uh, the deal that Xbox finally got PlayStation to agree to sign to for call of duty and all these things. So a little bit, of some juicy details there, but we'll get into the Activision stuff later. I promise that part will actually be kind of interesting this week, as opposed to previous weeks where I'm just 
and droning on and on about what the fuck is happening. And uh, aside from that, we got a lot of other interesting news, including the death of Xbox Live, but we'll get into that in a little while. Guys, talk about our corrections. No, we have no corrections this week, although there is probably something I technically said wrong last week. There's nothing to correct, I guess, because I didn't I didn't put any corrections down. Nobody wrote in with a correction, and therefore we get to act like I did absolutely nothing wrong. So that would put us in our main opening segment, if that can even make sense. You know, it's like we have opening segments, we have the main news, we have some closing segments. But of the opening segments, here's our main opening segment, which is the mildly amusing stories, updates to last week's stories, et cetera, et cetera. This week, we're going to start off with a little bit of Star Wars news. Bet you weren't expecting that. Ubisoft's discussing Star Wars Outlaws and the size and scope of the game from VGC. Star Wars Outlaws creative director Julian Gerdy Ger- uh, has revealed fresh details about Ubisoft's recently announced open world game in an interview with the last in the latest issue of Edge magazine via Games Radar. He discussed that the size of the game's in-game planets and how the title's protagonist was influenced by Han Solo, saying, quote, It's a crude analogy, but the size of the planets might be about equivalent to two of the zones in Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Um, it could be about two to three zones, but it's not quite, you know, the sort of epic, the whole of England recreation approach, he clarified, adding that the planets and outlaws will be manageable in size for both players and developers at Ubisoft Massive. Here the also reportedly said that planets and locations are being handcrafted, meaning that, quote, we haven't procedurally generated an entire planet at all. Set between the events of The Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi, the game stars outlaw protagonist K. Vest. Quote, when you think about the scoundrel on your mind, when you think about scoundrels in Star Wars, your mind goes to Han Solo. It goes to Lando, it goes to Indiana Jones, it goes to James Bond, it goes to Captain Jack Sparrow. He doesn't say in Star Wars, he says when you think of scoundrels. So for those wondering why James Bond and Jack Sparrow come to mind when you're thinking about Star Wars, uh, he says when you think of scoundrels. So James Bond, Jack Sparrow, Lando, Han Solo, Indiana Jones. It was a fantasy I connected with the most uh, in the original Star Wars trilogy as a child. I was much, much b- a bigger fan of Han Solo and Chewbacca than any of the others. However, at Massive, they wanted to tell, uh, sorry, they wanted its protagonist to be a little bit more relatable than Harrison Ford's character. More of a rookie, a petty thief, who ends up in a situation that's much bigger than they ever expected, he explained. Announced back in June, Star Wars Outlaws is scheduled to release in 2024 for Xbox Series X and S, as well as PC and via Ubisoft Connect. So yeah, I mean, this is a, uh, I'm actually looking forward to this game. We, we talked about when it was announced and showed off a couple, you know, month back. I think this game looks bad. Ass. I'm actually a little surprised by how underwhelmed it seems most people reacted to the game. I, I don't see what's not to love. It's it's odd to me because I look at a game like Star Wars Jedi, and I'm like, that's fine. I played the first one. I, I have no interest to really go back and play the second one. But then I see a game like this. I'm like, this is a Star Wars game I can get down with. I don't, I don't remember the name of it, but there was a Star Wars game on the N64 that I absolutely loved. I'm actually going to pull this up. So this was a game. Is it Shadow of the Empire? Yeah, it, must, it actually must have been this. Yeah, this is a game I used to play back on the N64 that I absolutely loved. And I know, like, everyone has a favorite old Star Wars game, but I feel like this is one that doesn't get brought up enough. And I don't know if this was technically considered a bad Star Wars game or a good one, and God knows I haven't played this game since I was, like, nine years old, so who knows if it was ever actually good. But you played as, like, knockoff Han Solo in this game, and I just remember really loving this game as a child and keeping in mind that as a kid, I didn't care for Star Wars at all. I didn't watch the movies. My brothers liked them a lot. I never had any interest in Star Wars whatsoever. But for some reason, this one game spoke to me. So I went and picked it up at Rhino's Games when I was like eight or nine years old. And I played the hell out of this game. And it was just always like, I just remember being like knockoff Han Solo, the video game. But I just, I don't know. I just loved it. I loved the gunslinging. I loved the Star Wars aesthetic, but it being like a shooting game and not having like the magic powers and the swords and everything that, that the other Star Wars games had. And I just, I always kind of dug this. So I feel like this is, in a weird way, even though it's very removed and technically the game is, you know, Star Wars Outlaws is nothing like a spiritual successor to this game. In a weird way, this kind of feels like we're getting some of the magic young Jesse experience playing Star Wars Shadow of the Empire recreated in Star Wars Outlaw, where it's like a game focused on being a bounty hunter, being a gunslinger in the Star Wars universe, kind of set in the old 
era of Star Wars that everyone, you know, that the longtime Star Wars fans all seem to yearn for. And I just, I don't know, it just seems like kind of exciting. And then throwing a little bit of that GTA flavor with the open world stuff and being able to like hijack vehicles and then fly from planet to planet. I'm like really down for this game. So to me, this sounds great. I love that they're leaning into the kind of gunslinging uh, scoundrel type character. I, I think I think that sounds fun. I think it sounds different than just being like the, uh, the overtly good guy, although they're trying to, they do mention they're trying to make the character a little more relatable, which I find kind of dis- disappointing. I feel like it's, I, I don't know, like we they always play characters a little safe these days where it's like, why can't we just have a protagonist here you're kind of supposed to admit is kind of a shitty person, but you like him anyway, other than Deadpool, I guess. But I don't know. I, I, I'm excited for this game. I'm intrigued by its world. I think there's a lot of potential for this game to be pretty great. And seeing that they're making a big game, but it's not like a stupid, absurdly huge game. And that they're going to try to make it like a cool, unique, different approach for Star Wars. Something we don't see a lot. Something that is reminding me of a Star Wars game that came out like almost 30 years ago. Instead of, you know, just like every other Star Wars game we get where it's swords and, and swords and shields and stuff or whatever it is in Star Wars. I don't know. I feel like this is unique. It's a breath of fresh air and the game sounds exciting. I'm just, I don't know. I'm really open-minded to Star Wars Outlaws. I definitely, definitely want to give that game a go when it comes out next year. As for what's next, let's talk about a little bit of Call of Duty. Call of Duty is going to come up a couple times in the show this week. I mean, it has to. We're going to talk about Activision and the Microsoft deal. And then there's actual Call of Duty news in the week, in the news, which we're about to get into. And then there's some other Call of Duty stuff we got to bring up. So if you hate Call of Duty, I'm sorry. It is one of the absolute biggest games in gaming history, so you're just gonna have to deal with that. It's just part of being a an Xbox gamer. Is that like Call of Duty is a is a is an inevitability, so it's unavoidable. Here we go. Activision have confirmed that a range of content from the most recent Call of Duty game, Modern Warfare 2, will be transferable to Call of Duty 2023. This past Monday, they posted on Twitter, the Call of Duty account, a poll asking if Modern Warfare 2 operators, weapons, and bundles should be able to carry forward into this year's entry. The two available options in the poll were yes and yes when it's revealed. When is the game revealed? The Call of, uh, Call of Duty 2023 is reportedly a continuation of last year's Modern Warfare 2. However, this one is developed by Sledgehammer Games as opposed to Infinity Ward. In fact, leaks of the past week leading to actionable takedowns by Activision gave a much clearer idea as to just what we might expect from this year's Call of Duty. Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3 as it's being reportedly named in reference from DMCA strikes from publishers Activision received uh, by Tuesday by tw- sorry Activision received by Twitter users who have been sharing images of the unannounced game online in recent days including at Bobby Network UK who's been just sharing a bunch of screenshots and information and leaked content about the game it's thought that the image may have originated from the internet test of the title leaked images include logos operators weapons loadouts and more Back in February, Bloomberg claimed that Activision had originally planned to release a major Modern Warfare 2 expansion this year, but that the DLC had morphed into a full game over time. So I, it's no it's no secret at this point. I think even if you're not really tapped into like what's going on with Call of Duty, I think everyone's kind of caught on to the fact that, yeah, there's apparently a Modern Warfare 3 happening this year. Um, originally, the plan was, you know, last year, around the time Modern Warfare 2 was coming out in November, the rumor going around was, hey, well, actually what they're doing for the next Call of Duty after Modern Warfare 2 is they're going to just do actually like a big DLC expansion. So rather than a brand new $70 game, next year what they're going to do is they're going to continue the multiplayer in the Warzone from Modern Warfare 2, but have a huge $40, $50 DLC around the time Call of Duty would normally come out. And it would be a new campaign and a bunch of new multiplayer maps and content to feed into Modern Warfare 2, just a massive expansion. So kind of like a Halo 3 ODST moment, but for Modern Warfare 2. And that was kind of the initial understanding of what we would be getting for Call of Duty this year. That would be like a direct sequel, but if through the, through expansion content rather than being a standalone game, well, it would be kind of silly for Activision to just leave all that money on the table knowing that every year they get away with releasing a brand new fully completed Call of Duty game. So I guess over time the project kind of shifted and now what the reports are saying is that we're going to basically just get straight up Modern Warfare 3, but it is a little odd because Infinity Ward is the Modern Warfare team. Infinity Ward made 
the original trilogy of Modern Warfare games, and they made the new Modern Warfare 1 and 2, but now Modern Warfare 3 is supposedly a Sledgehammer game, Sledgehammer being the team that originally did support work on the original Modern Warfare 3 back in 2011, and then did their own Call of Duty games, Advanced Warfare, World War II, and most recently, the much maligned uh, Vanguard. So it's a little interesting to see them put as the lead on this project. I, I, I don't know, there's, some, there's something odd about, like, you let the core team create and shepherd these first two entries in a trilogy, and then you hand the finale off to someone else. I think that's, I don't know, it's a little weird. It's, um, I don't know, it's like a Sam Raimi made Spider-Man 1 and 2, and then and then was just like, fucking, I, I don't know, who else is a director? What's a director that's not named Sam Raimi? I don't fucking know. Uh, but it's, hey, not Sam Raimi, here you go. Can you make Spider-Man 3 for me? It's just, I don't know, it's a, it's a weird... It's a weird. I almost said, "What if Sam Raimi gave a uh, the guy that makes the Evil Dead movies the 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 reins to Spider Man three, and then I realized, oh, that's the same director." Uh, but anyway, I don't know. It, it just almost be like George Lucas. Uh, well, actually, it's not fair because George Lucas didn't make all the old Star Wars movies, so I don't really have a good example. Uh, that's just goes to show how limited my knowledge of film is. But it, it's it's weird to me that. Activision is going to build, do the, the part one of the story and then build it further in part two and then hand the keys to a completely different team to finish up their story. So I almost wonder if what's happening is Infinity Ward is making the campaign to this, but Sledgehammer has been put on duty to do support work and then handle the multiplayer component because what they're making isn't actually like a full-blown brand new top-to-bottom Call of Duty game. It's essentially just a bunch of expansion content being packaged and sold as an independent game that also reads data off of and plays into your Modern Warfare 2 save file and purchases and progression and all that. So it seems like that's really what we're getting here is this year's Call of Duty is just going to be some weird Frankenstein game between Sledgehammer and Infinity Ward, which is kind of fitting because that's kind of what the original Modern Warfare 3 was. And it's just going to be some glorified standalone expansion sold as a sequel. Uh, but it just, yeah, all your progress and guns and characters and purchases carry over from Modern Warfare 2 to Modern Warfare 3. I don't know. I would like to see them still kind of bleed together the multiplayers of both games because I think that'd be awesome if it's just you could have all the new multiplayer content coming out this year in addition to all the content from last year, and just have one massive multiplayer suite, I think that'd be really cool. That's why I want more of a uh, Halo Halo ODST-style approach to this. But we'll have to wait and see. The game is set to be announced. You know, they haven't said anything officially, Activision, um, but, the you know, if history is any indication, and if the rumors are to be believed, and so far the rumors have been pretty accurate about everything, uh, this game should be announced announced in an in-game Warzone event in in uh, August. So probably, we're probably about three weeks away or so, three or four weeks away from getting a proper reveal for this game, and I bet it is a Modern Warfare 3. So it's kind of weird that's happening this way. I, I quite enjoy this new Modern Warfare series they're doing the campaigns i think the campaigns have been pretty fucking awesome so i'm a little apprehensive about this because i thought modern warfare 1 and modern warfare 2 and the raids in modern warfare 2 have had just really cool characters really cool story moments and i'm worried because i don't trust sledgehammer to make as good of a campaign as good of a story i'm worried about them finishing off the story with modern warfare 3 because that would kind of suck um, if they just, I don't know, if they just take their, I don't let's put it this way. Call of Duty Vanguard had possibly the lamest set of characters ever in a Call of Duty game. And that campaign suffered greatly because of its dog shit characters. So I would really hate for the the, the masterminds behind that to be in charge of uh, bringing the Modern Warfare 2 story to the finish line. Because Modern Warfare 2 has such a cool campaign and a cool cast of characters. But then again, I'm also thinking too much in the um there's one last thing i'll say and we can move on I, i'm also thinking too much in the archetypal framework of what they've done in the past whereas like oh yeah they made a modern warfare one two and three and then they moved on so that's what they're doing here they're making modern warfare one two and three although what's probably a lot more likely because the whole point of this modern warfare 2019 kind of reboot on the call of duty universe was probably a way to start from scratch and be like why would we move on from modern warfare when we could just keep it going forever we could do what black ops does where black ops didn't end after black ops 3 black ops just kept going it was world of war then black ops then black ops 2 3 4 cold war you know the next one's black ops 5 or whatever like they can just keep going and going and going 
we should do that with Modern Warfare because I think that is probably ultimately the plan because if you think about it, Infinity War didn't have success after Modern Warfare. They did Modern Warfare 1, 2, and 3 and then Ghost didn't do as well and nobody really liked Infinite Warfare. So it the whole point of this kind of rebooting the Modern Warfare universe is probably to build out a bigger universe so that they can do Modern Warfare 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. You know, do it as long as it will as the market will sustain that universe is probably the deal. So I I keep thinking this confined way of how it was in the past where I'm like, okay, they did three Modern Warfares back in the day, which means this Modern Warfare 3 should be the last one. But this will probably just be yet another entry in the Modern Warfare series. You know, if Activision were smart, because otherwise, what do you do? You put, you put Infinity Ward back in the same predicament they were in back when Call of Duty Ghosts and Infinite Warfare came out, where it's like, okay, you done with Modern Warfare. Those were really popular. They sold really well. People really liked them. Now what do you do? <laughs> and uh, so I, I don't know. We'll, we'll have to wait and see a couple of weeks away from finding out. But uh, that's, yeah, that's uh, what's going on with uh, this year's Call of Duty, because as we all know, there are only three things that are given in this life. It is li- in, in, in this world, I should say. It is life, it is death, and it is Call of Duty releasing annually. So moving on, we'll get back to Call of Duty in a little while. But let's talk a little bit about uh, loot boxes, something that I feel like we don't really doesn't really come up anymore in the in the you know in the discussion of video games these days it's not really much of a thing these days but the UK games industry has revealed plans to restrict access to loot boxes for under 18 year olds UK games industry uh, body Yuki has published a new set of principles that it says will leave room for the industry to self regulate Principles surrounding loot boxes in video games are recommended by the Technical Working Group. The Technical Working Group was convened by the Department of Culture, Media, and Sports. Quote, we've been clear that video games need to do more to protect children and adults from the harms associated with loot boxes, said the Minister of Creative Industries, John Whitting- Whittingale. Whittingale. Uh, these new principles are a big step forward to make sure that players can enjoy video games responsibly and safely. I look forward to seeing game companies put the plans in action, and I'll be watching their progress closely. Weird. Uh, the first of these is to push the use of parental controls into an effective restriction that uh, effectively restrict the purchase of loot boxes for any user under 18. These parental controls vary by platform, and it's argued that, there aren't as, that they aren't as prominent as they should be and are too cer- uh, simple to circumvent. This task will be achieved by a public information campaign, which will share best practices with parents and guardians who may be unaware of loot boxes or the parent uh, control that are available to them in their child's console. Yuki also outlines game companies that must show probabilities of the content of loot boxes ahead of purchase. This is already a case in some games, such as the hugely popular FIFA Ultimate Team, which I I didn't know that. However, it's unclear if these rules will be tightened at the very moment. FIFA's probabilities are extremely generic, whatever. Progress on these guidelines will be reviewed in a year after implementation. So, I don't know. I find this kind of weird because this just seems like really good action for a problem that hasn't been a problem in like five-ish years. I don't know. I feel like loot boxes were kind of the talk of the town in like the early to mid Xbox One generation. But towards the end of the Xbox One generation, basically it seems like every service game or multiplayer game kind of shifted away from loot boxes into the realm of battle passes and so i just find this a little weird that they're taking such big action on loot boxes when not to say that there aren't issues with loot boxes but just to say i can't even think of a game that's come out in the past four years that has a loot loot boxes i'm just actually that's not true at all um i'm playing exo primal right now which we'll talk about in a little bit and i think that has loot boxes maybe I don't know. We'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But this is, listen, this is fine. I, I'm i of multiple minds with this. I do think loot, bo- loot boxes are mildly predatory. I, I also think maybe parents need to kind of just be left to, you know, decide what games their kids can and can't play and maybe just be made aware of what's in the game and, and, and leave it at that. I just think it's kind of weird that we, people want to like, remove loot boxes or or like give things a mature rating because of the inclusion of loot boxes just as long as you effectively communicate to the user like hey this exists in this game this is how it is i mean you've done what you can do the rest is kind of up to the user to decide how they're gonna how they're gonna respond from there but i don't know i don't find any of this to be really overbearing because it seems like that really is just what they're talking about it's just you know further education of parental controls more 
notation of the inclusion of loot boxes and then adding the probability counter, which I actually think is a uh, kind of cool because it it holds it, it forces the developer to be a little more honest about the realities of winning in a loot box and maybe encourages them to make the odds not quite as shitty as they normally would be because they know it's going to be a bad look if the odds are ridiculous so i don't know i don't have much to say about this because again i feel like loot boxes just aren't really much of a thing the industry has largely moved away from loot boxes like we were just talking about call of duty call of duty was all over loot boxes around the uh triple jump jetpack era of call of duty and uh since you know since like i don't know what world war ii or black ops 4 we haven't really seen loot boxes. It's been more of the uh, battle passes and $20 skins type of payment model, much more like what Fortnite does. So I don't know. I guess we can talk about loot boxes a little more if you want to, but I, I just feel like I'm stuck in 2018 if we do that. So I guess we can move on. And speaking of things that feel a little bit dated, but are no less uh, sad to see go. Uh, not that I'm sad to see loot boxes go, but I am sad to see this next one go. Final little uh, opening story of the week. Larry Herb, Major Nelson, Xbox's Director of Programming and the longstanding spokesperson for Microsoft's gaming business, has announced that he's leaving the company after 22 years. In an announcement shared to his social media accounts on Friday, Herb thanked fans and colleagues as he said he looked forward to the next chapter of his career. Quote, After 20 years, I've decided to take a step back and work on the next chapter of my career. As I take a moment to think about all that I have done, all, all that we have done together, I want to thank the millions of gamers around the world that have included me as part of their lives. Also, thanks to the Xbox team members for trusting me to have a direct dialogue with our customers. The future is bright for Xbox, and as a gamer, I'm excited to see this evolution. Herb confirmed the X, that Xbox's official podcast will be taking a hiatus and then return at a later date. He's yet to confirm what the next career move for him will, what his next career move will be. So, this is an end of an era type of deal. I I don't know. It's like it's everyone who likes Xbox, who's followed Xbox, who's been a fan of Xbox, knows who Major Nelson is. And to see, I don't know, it's, to see that he's uh, walking away and he's he's moving on to something else in his life. You know, it's like a simultaneous, like, good for you. Hope you find happiness and that your next, you know, your next move is something that's more fulfilling or better suits you at this stage in your life or whatever the fuck, you know. But, man, that's a that's a big and that's a big end of an era. And we have two of these this week. It's kind of a, a double stinger this week where we got this and then we got some Xbox Live news in a little bit where it just feels like, I don't know, L Larry Herb was a big part of the xbox 360 days i mean he's been there since basically the beginning of xbox but he's a huge part of the xbox 360 into the xbox one years um and his his podcast which i think they changed the name of the podcast at one point i, I don't think it used to be called this but now it's just called uh, the official x what the official xbox podcast i don't know maybe it was always called that and i'm just misremembering but i swear that's not what it used to be called i don't know but um yeah i mean it's it's kind of fitting you could kind of feel that Maybe his time wasn't long for Xbox. Uh, I was actually thinking about Major Nelson recently. It kind of briefly came to my head when I was thinking about kind of the influencer, influencer, uh, so what am I, speak English, Jesse, the influencer kind of nature of a lot of the executives at Xbox and how the Aaron Greenbergs and the Phil Spencers and the Sarah Bonds of the world have kind of taken over, you know, these, these executives, these corporate type figures that have had this kind of influencer type spokesperson role for the company and kind of become mascots for the Xbox brand and how they're so relevant and popular. But Xbox has always had someone, someone like this with, with major Nelson and how it just feels like in recent years, major Nelson has kind of been pushed to the push to the side a little bit. Like his, his persona, his character, his little influencer kind of thing that he's got going on for the Xbox brand hasn't been as impactful or notable, you know, in the face of these other more actively like involved, like um, type executive people like Phil Spencer kind of stepping up and being more of a, a face and a figure for the fan, for the fan base. So his, his role has been almost made a little bit redundant in that regard, which I kind of lament because I like major Nelson. He's, he's, you know, he's a, he's a, he's a PR guy. He works for Xbox. He works for Microsoft. He, you know, he's not, he's not paid to say, you know, bad things or speculate or, 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 you know, I mean, he's, he's a PR guy at the end of the day. So there's only, there's only so much she can say and do, but he's, I don't know. He's one of those people. He kind of reminds me of like, um, 
like like a little bit of like a Jeff Keeley type where it's like, you know, he's kind of got this little buttoned up industry guy thing going on. But there's something about him where he has a very contagiously likable personality and you you want to he's, he's he seems like a friendly guy. You, you want to be buddy buddy with him. He he builds that kind of fun, like corporate PR, a little bubble for the Xbox brand that makes it a little more fun to be involved in. And, you know, maybe you could think it's a little grimy or greasy to have that kind of position within a company because it's like i don't why why is xbox trying to be my friend you know xbox should just be a product that i engage with because they have games i want to play but you know sometimes sometimes the marketing works and and major nelson's just one of those people where it's like i've always just thought he seems like a cool guy i like i like this guy i like having him around he's he's fun for the brand he's fun for the community i like major nelson so it, it is sad to see him go and it does seem like his role has been diminished or kind of just minimized in recent years and so it's not all that surprising to see that this is his time to go and you know we don't know the real reason for why he's leaving maybe he was pushed out maybe he just decided like i'm good with this i feel like i'm at a good stopping point with this we don't know but you know it's not really for us to sit here and speculate on i guess it's just really to say i don't know i guess good luck major nelson good luck larry herb uh thank you for the many many years of just being a voice and a face for the xbox brand again you know it's like the there's the part of me that's like, fuck the government, fuck the corporations that wants to be like, I'm not going to sit here and get all sentimental over some PR spokesperson for a, a brand owned by one of the most powerful and wealthy corporations known to humanity. But at the same time, I'm like, I, I, I like this guy. I like the Xbox. I like the, the little X logo that lights up on my controller and I get to play Halo. And then the, the Major Nelson guy does the podcast and it's fun. And it's, you know, in a world where you have, a, you know, YouTube celebrities who got wealthy and famous for being, you know, egregiously not funny, making ukulele apology songs for preying on underage boys, you know, and people like that becoming wealthy and famous in a world where things like that are allowed to happen and exist. It's just, you know, there's something kind of cozy and comforting about knowing that there's guys out there like Major Nelson. We can all just live in our little bubbles and just for for maybe a moment pretend like uh, like uh, like all the other bullshit doesn't happen and we can just and just enjoy our, our Halo 3 and things like that. So, Major Nelson, a, a major salute to you, sir. Good luck on whatever's next. Thank you for the many, many years of uh, entertainment and, and and camaraderie and fun. Not that I knew you personally, but, uh, again, you just always seemed like a cool guy. So, end of an era there. And then we've got another one to talk about when we get to the main news, but we'll, we'll take a stop there. We'll uh, Before we get into the main news, we'll talk about the games I've been playing this week because I want to talk to you a little bit about Exo Primal. But before I can tell you about what I've been playing, I do want to first tell you briefly about what I've been eating. You guys, I'm a little surprised we've made it over 200 episodes of Xbox On, and never once have we talked about Build Your Own Pizzas. Now, this is a a restaurant concept, a quick service type eatery concept that has been, I'd say, pretty prominent, at least here in America, for over a decade, I'd say, probably longer. But in terms of, you know, like coming up in in Georgia, uh, I I feel like this is something that you really start to see these kinds of chain build your own pizza type places pop up around and maybe like the early 2010s or so. And uh, I feel like that popularity has maybe peaked a little bit, but these places are still mostly around. I'm talking about your mod pizzas, your Mamma Mia p- custom pizza. I, I actually don't know what that other one's called. I know there's MOD or mod pizza. I know there's Blaze. I know there's one that's like something about Mamma Mia, but then there's also probably like 800,000 knockoff New York pizza place is called Mamma Mia's. Either way, I want to talk about that a little bit today because um, it's been a while since I've been to one of these places. And this past week, weekend, Friday, whatever, last week, Friday, my girlfriend and I are uh, on our on a, a rare Friday night where we get to actually go out and do something. And so we go to see the new Mission Impossible movie. I'm very excited about this. We got the $5 T-Mobile Tuesday ticket. So I get to see the brand new Mission Impossible movie, I'm ready for some dumb action, I'm ready to have a good time, and we decide to uh, go to the Blaze Pizza over at Disney Springs real quick for some dinner before we head over there, we're trying to make it a budget date night, we got the $5 tickets, we got the build your own $10 pizza, why not, so it's been a long, long time since I've been to a Blaze Pizza, and I remember being like, this place is good, but it's nothing I, I, I need to have in my life again, and so... You know, I'm excited to kind of give it a uh, give it a go, considering I haven't had Blaze Pizza in maybe five or six years. And uh, you know what? I got I got to sing the praises of Blaze Pizza in these various kind of build your own pizza places. So for those who aren't 
extremely familiar with the concept, although I assume these kinds of places are at least all over North America, but who knows, maybe they've expanded into other other uh, markets around the world. But uh, basically, the, the, the crux of these, of these places is it's like it's kind of like a quick service type, like like a burrito place or like a Chipotle style restaurant where, you know, you uh, you walk in there and you you fucking tell them, oh, I want, I'll get a pizza. And they're like, OK, pick your pick your crust. You're like, OK, I'll get regular or rising or gluten free or whatever. And then it's like, pick your sauce. And they got a bunch of sauces. You pick your sauce. They slap and they, they got like these little 10 inch personal, 10, 11 inch personal pizzas, just kind of. The doughs are like pretty stretched out for you. You pick your dough, you pick your sauce, you pick your cheese blends, you pick your toppings, and then they like put your number on it, throw it in a in a pizza fire brick oven, ninety cents, ninety seconds in in the in the flames, and then boom, you got a fresh hot pizza ready for you, customized just the way you want it, and they're all personal size, so it's kind of fun. It's like a you know instead of getting like a huge ass pizza to share with your family or friends, you just everyone gets these own little like a uh, ten inch personal size pizzas. So I, I like it. It's a fun idea. And so I'm trying to get really creative with it. I think I kind of fucked mine up a little bit. I think I went a little too hard with mine. I did I did regular crust. I did light red sauce. And then I did a blend of mozzarella and ricotta. I don't know why the fuck I want ricotta, but I did a blend of mozzarella and the ricotta. And then I got on top of it a little bit of grilled chicken, just a just a, a little a little touch of bacon. And then I loaded it with onions, green bell peppers, basil leaves cherry tomatoes what else we put in there we put some oregano some salt and pepper and then oh roasted garlic and then they they throw that sucker in the flames for 90 seconds pull that bitch out and then they hit it with a with a pesto a pesto glaze on top like a pesto drizzle on top so it was a very overwhelming amount of flavors but you know it's ten dollars it's an experiment gone wild i'm ready to try it it was okay it wasn't bad it, it was you know it was just so much going on in that pizza, but it was fun. You know, you got the fucking, the tomatoes were all blistered. The basil's like baked in there. So you got that strong basil flavor and it's, it's delicious. And a lot of that roasted garlic, it was, it was very good pizza. And I enjoyed it quite a bit. And uh, I just, I don't know. It's like, my, I guess my takeaway is like Blaze Pizza, these MO Mod Pizza, these various kinds of pizza places where you, where it's like, a, you know, these little quick service personal pizzas where you get to customize them. They're not particularly excellent pizzas but you know it's like you always say about pizza when it's when it's when it's good it's great when it's when it's bad it's good it's you know it's always serviceable but just the the novelty of being able to customize it any way you want and have like no price limit on just basically doing whatever well i think there is a limitation on how many toppings you can get it's kind of like a black ops 2 pick 10 system where i think they they're like you can put 10 things on this but it can be any 10 things and uh it's pretty good you can go kind of nuts with it and it's a lot of fun and uh, I don't know. I just feel like this is a very the novelty of this concept to me hasn't worn off. I still think it's very unique. It's very creative. It's very fun. It was fucking crazy packed when we went there. So clearly there's still a huge market that's in, that's out there enjoying this. But then again, in Florida, especially Orlando, everything is busy all the time, forever and always without. A f I, I mean, I haven't been to a place that isn't anything less than overcrowded since the day I moved to Florida. Let me tell you, everything here is just so goddamn busy all the time. But uh yeah, I mean, shout out to Blaze Pizza. Fun time, good prices, solid pizza, a lot of fun getting to make mix and match your own pizza. I'm excited about next time I go there. I think I'm going to try to do the same pizza I did, but tweak some things to try to make it a little better. I think I'm going to do without the ricotta. I'm going to go back to maybe just a classic, you know, like a Parmesan mozzarella blend. Maybe take out the bacon and then, yeah, just try, try a couple different things. But overall pretty fun place let me know have you ever been to a blaze pizza or something like a blaze pizza where you get to build your i know there's damn i know there's another chain like that i've been to i just don't remember the name of it doesn't matter shout out to blaze pizza build your own pizza 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 little caesar's pizza you know all about it that's it for what i've been playing guys now we move on to the what i've been no that's it for what i've been eating now we move on to the what i've been playing which is exo primal you guys it came out on game pass last week brand new Capcom game that no one was really hyped about. It looked kind of like the only Capcom game in recent history to not be all that interesting, but nonetheless, it happened. It's here. I played it. I gotta say, I I think I like Exo Primal. It seems like overall the uh, reaction to the game has been pretty like mid to slightly negative. But I actually I think the game's pretty fine. It's um. It is a textbook Game Pass game. Exo Primal is certainly the kind of game where it's like, 
I would never have bought this game for 60 or 70 bucks. I would not recommend to people to buy this game for 60 or 70 bucks, but as an included thing in Game Pass, I would say absolutely give it a download and and try it out for Saturday afternoon and see see if it's something that maybe you'll be interested in. It seems like the kind of game that could be really fun to play with friends. It's definitely very multiplayer centric, but yeah, try, trying to get into the nitty gritty of it a little bit. I, I don't know what to make of this game because the moment to moment gameplay feels pretty good. I feel like the combat feels good. It's a little fast. It's a little frantic. It's some solid third person shooting action. You get a bunch of different abilities. Every kind of uh, armor class comes with different kinds of skills and benefits and abilities and things like that. And it's fun to mix and match and design your character and get your play style down. And then to just fight these Left 4 Dead style hordes of of dinosaurs that are just dropping into this fucking future Tokyo type city through these teleportation portals for no discernible reason whatsoever. It's fun. It's cool. I actually like it a lot. He plays these like knockoff Gundam mech warriors facing off against dinosaurs. And I think that's a really fun idea. You know, last week I was talking about how games take themselves too seriously. I think there's a lot of room and, and, and I have a lot of, a, a lot of, um, a lot of like a uh, kind of yearning to go back in some way to those just more ridiculous games that embrace video gameness rather than always trying to be like a super serious uh, Oscar bait style, you know, narrative. So this game is exactly that kind of thing where it's just it's not trying to be serious at all. It's not trying to be cool. Uh, actually, maybe maybe it is trying to be cool, but it is uh, it is it is certainly some some just double A popcorn garbage junk food and uh I think it benefits from being that a little bit. I think I think leaning into that is its strength. Now, what's weird about the game is the game is only one mode. I don't know why it's only one mode. Um, the game definitely feels underbaked as a result of this, but it is this PvPVE style multiplayer mode that acts as multiplayer campaign, PvP, VE, and also like your grindable like live service element thing. So it's like everything in one, but it's just one game mode. And so right off the bat, the game has a severe shortage of replayability just by way of not having enough variety of game to play. Like there's there needs to be more modes because while the core gameplay loop is solid and it's a decent amount of fun, it's just not, you know, this one core gameplay mode is just not enough to carry an entire game's worth of this is where it comes in where I, I, I could not recommend this game for full price. Like if you were going to buy this game for 60 bucks or whatever, I could not recommend with the amount of limited content it has, could not recommend this game for that much money because it gets old fast. I'll, I'll be honest. Um, it, it's weird. It's like the game mode is like there's two teams of four and you have these objectives, but the objectives mostly just boil down to follow the objective to the next area, fight a bunch of hordes of dinosaurs, move on to the next objective. But the catch is it's kind of like that gambit mode from destiny where it's like everything you're doing, the enemy team is also doing. And so it's kind of a race to see which team can get through all the objectives fastest. And there's like four or five objectives. And then you get to the final objective, which is basically that overwatch multiplayer mode where you got to like stand on the hard point objective as it like moves and carry it to the end goal. And then towards the end of that encounter, you meet up with the enemy team. And at that point, it goes from PvP or PV, yeah. P, I don't know, it goes from like just a PvP thing to like a PvP VE thing where you can now fight the enemy team, and it's just it's a whole thing. Like it sounds a little convoluted, it kind of is, but after a quick bit of playing it, a match or two, you'll pretty much catch on to everything that this mode entails and what it is. And then it becomes very, very. That's when it immediately becomes very apparent how thin the gameplay loop of this of of Exo Primal is, because it only took about two matches for me to be like, is is this all that this game is? It's just a couple different maps, but it's the same one mode over and over and over again. And the answer is yes. That that is what it is. And, and the campaign's weird as hell. Like there's cutscenes, but. It's like you you play a couple of matches of the online mode and then it lets you unlock a new cutscene. So you go into the world map and you select a new objective to see a new cutscene. And then you go back into the multiplayer, play more multiplayer to then unlock the next cutscene. So the campaign aspect is kind of entirely arbitrary. The characters are lame. It's super cringy. The game the game feels Japanese as hell once the cutscenes are happening because everyone's just 
it's fucking weird and cringe in, in, in anime. And so I just started, after like the third cutscene, I was like, you know what? Fuck this. I'm just skipping through the cutscenes. Don't care about this. And also the game just has a super awkward, overly long intro where the game just tries to, again, do that Japanese thing where it's like, let me show you every menu option, every control option, every little ounce of what this game has to offer so that you 100% know what you're getting into once we let you loose. But the problem with doing that in a game is you don't let the player immediately play the game and explore the game, you'll lose their interest pretty early on. So I felt that a little bit at the beginning of the game. I was like, I think this game is immediately losing me 20 minutes in, but I, I stuck through all the tutorial opening shit, and then I got to the real game. I'm like, okay, this game's actually pretty fun. It's just got a bad opening, and the campaign stuff and the cutscenes kind of suck. So just just bear through all that opening stuff and don't really pay attention to the cutscenes. And I think you have a pretty fun junk food weekend game to play either alone or with some friends it's because because obviously the core of the game is it's is it's combat it's it's gameplay loop and that part is pretty fun the the issue is just that it's a little thin it's a little light on content and i think if this game had a couple other modes if had a proper campaign if it had more of a survival round based mode or something like that or maybe more of like a Left 4 Dead mode where it's like you make it from point A to point B in these like objective safe house type uh, levels. I, I feel like if I had a couple things like that, it would be a lot more to flesh out the game and really make it uh, a lot more of a value and have a lot more replay value. Because again, at the very core of Exo Primal, I feel like they kind of nailed the harder parts, which is, is the game fun to play? Does the game feel good to play? Is the combat good? And the answer to all those things is yes, it's like it's actually pretty good. But, um, yeah, I mean, the menus are convoluted, the story is lame, the intro is a little long in the tooth, that stuff's not great, and there's not enough variety of the gameplay, so it it ends up making it a really fun, dumb Game Pass weekend game, but not a very good game that I would recommend go out there and spend your hard-earned cash on picking this game up, and so, yeah, it's very much a Game Pass game, Uh, continuing that trend where a lot of these non-Xbox first-party kind of day one Game Pass games end up being these kinds of things where it's like, yeah, I I wouldn't necessarily recommend this to most people or it has a very A or double A kind of budgety feel to it or feels like a game that the publisher wasn't totally confident would do well. And we see that a lot, Uh, you know, and and I don't mean that to the detriment of these games because some of these games I love. Like, I liked Atomic Heart a lot earlier this year. Like, I I love Outriders uh, when that came out two years ago. I think these games are great. Day one Game Pass games, what excellent value to a player like me. But Exoprimal... Is a perfect example of a game where it's like, yeah, the reason this is a day one Game Pass game is because Capcom did not have confidence in this game whatsoever. But um, it, it definitely shows when you play the game. But also, it's definitely a pretty fun time if you're not paying anything extra to get access to it, which is the case if you are already a Game Pass subscriber and you want to try something new. Um, that being said, I, I this game's got to go free to play at one point. At some point, you know, I'm thinking about like if you're a PlayStation Five player, you don't have an Xbox, and you're interested in Exo Primal. I really hope you don't accidentally waste your money on this game. Uh, th- this game feels like it should be free to play, and that that's in- increasingly apparent with. It's kind of aggressive uh, season pass model where it has a season pass you can grind through. And then in addition to that, it has loot crates. Although I can't tell if it's possible to buy or redeem to get, you know, with real world currency in any way, loot boxes or if they're just unlocked in the game exclusively, like in game currency only. I've gotten a couple of them, but again, I've only played like two hours of the game and I haven't completely made sense of all the convoluted menus and options and features of the game to speak authoritatively on how this works. But it seems like there is some kind of loot box or loot box adjacent uh, mechanic to this game, although I don't know if there's a way to spend real world money on it. But overall, that's that's Exoprimal. It, It may have sounded like I was pretty sour on it like I was pretty down on it but again I'm, I'm gonna say if you have game pass I think this game is 100% worth a download to just try out a little bit because once you make it past that kind of boring intro and tutorial the core gameplay loop is a lot of fun it it, it wears thin real fast I don't think it's it, it, it's gonna stay fresh and exciting to play for long it kind of reminds me of um kind of reminds me of that um Turtle Rock developed early Xbox One game Evolve. It reminds me of Evolve a little bit, not because it feels or plays or is like Evolve in its gameplay, because it's not at all. But Evolve was very much a game like this where it was like the core gameplay is pretty fun, but for $60, this game is 
definitely lacking. It's definitely not sticky enough to 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 make you want to spend sixty bucks and hang around for thirty, forty, fifty hours. It's not. It's not good enough for what they're asking. That's kind of how I feel about Exoprimal, but the difference is a game like Evolve came out before Game Pass existed. There's no option other than to buy it and be disappointed. Whereas a game like Exoprimal, you don't have to be disappointed because you can just try it, include it in your Game Pass subscription for no added cost, have your fun with it for a couple hours or a weekend, and then say, yeah, there's a lot of room for improvement, but I'm satisfied with the... Uh, 10 to 20 hours I got out of it and uh, now I'm going to move on with my life so that's kind of where I am with Exo Primal. I've only played maybe a total of 2-3 hours of the game I plan on coming back this weekend and playing more because I, I liked it enough that I want to play more and want to see more of it so I think that should speak a little bit to uh, it being not a bad game but the reason I didn't play more of it this weekend wasn't because I was at Disney World or too busy shaving my cat's fur or something like that. It was because there was another game, a very unexpected game, that distracted me and pulled me away from Exoprimal. It pulled me away from Persona 5. It pulled me away from every other game I could have been playing. And I would have never guessed if you told me in the days leading up to the, this past weekend that this was the game I'd be addicted to helplessly this weekend, I'd say, you're stupid, you have a dumb brain, but I don't say that to you because the truth of the matter is, I was hardcore addicted all weekend to playing 2012's Call of Duty Black Ops 2, that's right, it's the second time we gotta bring up Call of Duty this week, because I guess we'll put it here, but a big story that's happening in the world of Xbox this week is, out of nowhere... Activision had a big update for all of their old Call of Duty games. Everything from Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare back in 2007 all through up up through the newer games like Black Ops Cold War where they went back and they fixed all of these old Call of Duty games that have had matchmaking and server problems. Now, there are some rumors, some people saying, oh, actually, it's a, it's a Xbox, Xbox did it. Microsoft fixed it on their end. These are server issues that Xbox fixed on behalf of Activision. It's like, I don't, think that's possible or true but just to put it out there that's a thing people are saying I, I don't think there's any weight to that I think people are just being stupid I don't I don't know people immediately assume that Xbox is like got their hands all over COD and they haven't even closed this deal yet that's not how that works but regardless that's not important the, the important thing here is that overnight all of these old Call of Duty games, you know, modern, the old Modern Warfare 2, Black Ops, World at War, Black Ops 2, uh, freaking all, all these old Call of Duty games became playable overnight. Uh, they, they, these servers were fixed, the matchmaking was fixed, and suddenly people flooded back to these old Call of Duty games to the point where, like, these games all have, like, 10,000 plus players actively playing these games right now online. Like that is unheard of for games that, you know, some of these games are 10 years old. Some of these games are 15 years old. These are, you know, it, it hurts me to admit because these are games that are such a big part of my middle school and high school years. It makes me feel like an old person, but like these games are not new. These games are like 15 years old. These games are, these games are boomer games basically by, uh, by today's kids standards. So, Regardless, when I found out this was happening, I was like, no, uh, okay, for the the opportunity to go back and play a game like Black Ops or Black Ops 2 with little to no modders or, or, or hackers and to have a, a steady, healthy stream of players just jumping in and having a good time and not having to wait around trying to hit a match and ping is so bad that I'm playing with someone on the other side of the world and you know we're lagging out and our shots aren't registering properly. The opportunity to experience these games in a normal way, kind of like back in the day again, was just too, too good to pass up. So I found my old Black Ops 2 disc, I popped in my Xbox, and I said, let's give this thing a go. I get on there, there's over, there's almost 13,000 people online. There's well over 12,000 people online on Black Ops 2 when I did this. I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, there's enough people online to where I have options. Like, I, it's not like I can only play Team Deathmatch. It's like, I can play Domination. I can play Control. I can play Free For All. I can play Gun Game. I can play all these modes. I couldn't get into the capture the flag. I tried that. That, did, that didn't work. I missed capture the flag. But anyway, uh, yeah, so I, I've been playing Black Ops 2 on my Xbox 360, or well, on my Xbox Series X, but it's an Xbox 360 game. All, all weekend like crazy. And uh, Black Ops 2 is 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 kind of like uh, the, uh, the, the what could have been for me with Call of Duty because it's the one where it came out at a bad time. I didn't have a lot of like interest in it. I was kind of going through like an emo phase and I ended up buying it on the Wii U as a launch game for the Wii U. 
And I remember being like, this game kind of sucks because the zombies sucked because the Wii U version didn't get DLC. And it was only years and years later that I came back way after the game's life cycle where I came back and I realized this game's actually awesome. I was just too much of an emo freak at the time to appreciate it, and I purchased it on the wrong console, so I never got to experience all the awesome DLC this game had. So it, it took me many years to go back and get to experience how great Black Ops 2 was, but I always kind of lament that I didn't get the full experience because I wasn't on Xbox playing it. I was playing it on Wii U like a fucking idiot trying to justify Nintendo's not great console at the time, even though I technically like the Wii U side so that's that's a tangent the point is it was just a lot of fun this weekend to go back and be like fuck yeah because like my Xbox profile I'm not very leveled up or grinded on this game so like it just kind of felt like a from scratch experience going back experiencing Black Ops 2 going through the ranks unlocking the camos and the gun attachments and building out my classes and experiencing all the DLC it, it, it's it's super fun it was just it's been a really good time so I've been playing a lot of Black Ops 2 I'm probably going to try to get a little bit more of it in uh, I don't know how much longer this is going to last before either the player bases start to drop off a little bit and the kind of novelty of this wears off or whatever's going to happen I don't know um, you know everyone thought oh th these games are going to be littered with hackers and man there have been very few games I've had to back out of because hackers like maybe two or three I played like five hours of Black Ops 2 this weekend and I maybe had to back out of two or three matches due to hackers. Like that's how that's how like naturally uh, populated these servers are right now. And it's fucking cool. I need to go back and play like World at War or something. But yeah. So shout out to that. Apparently like their report and it's hard to say because it's a lot of like Twitter reporting where people are just making shit up and people are being stupid. But there are people saying that like right now Xbox is is selling well right now on and like Amazon and at like retailers because people are going back trying to get their hands on Xboxes so they can go play these old Call of Duties. Uh, and the only thing that really lends any credibility to that is the fact that right now all these old Call of Duty games are on sale on the Xbox store right now digitally. And they're cracking like the top ten best selling games at the moment on Xbox. So like people are people are buying Black Ops Two and Old Modern Warfare Two and all these games by the boatloads right now. You can see them; they're all on sale for like ten to fifteen dollars each on the Xbox Live. So or on the Xbox Store. So it's just it's crazy. It's like what a fun wacky throwback moment. I I, I see a lot of people trying to do the thing where they're trying to pl tie it into what's going on in the news right now with Activision and Xbox. I don't I don't know that there's any credibility to any of that stuff. I think this is just I think this is just coincidental timing. I don't think this has anything to do with anything. It's just a good time to go back and relive some old memories if you uh if you if you're someone like me who grew up playing like old Modern Warfare 2 or the Black Ops games or any of these games. It's it's a good time to go back and relive some of those uh, memories. Hey, remember, guys, times have changed. If you're going to jump on these games and, and, and relive the glory days, remember to watch your mouth on there. Be careful about what you say about someone's mother. And uh, otherwise, you know, have fun, you know, and trash talk one another. Um, get lit, stay up till four in the morning. Be that asshole that plays your shitty rap music through the through your Xbox mic, so everyone has to hear that fuzzy, muffled shit that nobody uh, asked for. You know, it's like it's it's the good old days. It feels comforting. It feels warm. It feels like home. So enjoy yourselves out there. And that's it for what I've been playing. Oh wait, I, we had a comment here. Oops, I'm, I, I totally forgot. Headhunting Halo wrote in. Let me. I don't want to miss you, Headhunting Halo. He said, uh, "God, I wish I remember to read this when it was supposed to be read." Headhunting Halo wrote in says, well, I've been playing the hell out of Exoprimal. Honestly, really fun. And the more you play, the more evolved dinos you take down. My player level is already 43 and my battle pass is sitting at a 26 out of 50. So already halfway through and I recommend playing it. I also went to my local sex shop and explaining why Astro Glide is $31 for a six ounce tube. Inflation is hitting, <laughs> is even hitting that apparently. Anarchy, Starfield, you're getting so close and I love you. Okay, well, head on to Halo. Thank you for sharing that. I'm sorry that your Astro Glide is $31 for a six ounce tube, but uh, glad to see you're loving Exo Primal. Again, I think that's a good testament to just, you know, it's a great Game Pass game, something definitely worth picking up and just having a fun weekend, maybe seeing if you can get the boys together or, uh, you know, the boys and girls together or the boys and church mates together or the co-workers together or whatever combination of uh, xbox players you get you get together when you play multiplayer but all right let's take a quick break let's head on into the main news and uh we'll talk about xbox live and what's going on with activision blizzard so stay tuned for that all right so i thought we'd do something a little different rather than just kicking off straight with all the uh 
FTC, CMA, Activision, Microsoft stuff. Although that is more pleasant to talk about this week than it was in previous weeks. Uh, I thought we'd kick off with the other big news story this week because... I don't know, it's, it's maybe not as important technically, but it, it's, it's, I think it's a more interesting story to talk about, and it's a nice, nice breath of fresh air from um, all the acquisition and merger stuff. It's a nice little something to talk about the history of Xbox and something that's changing and I don't know, remembering Xbox Live. So let's just jump right into it. From VGC, Microsoft have announced the plans to replace its long-running Xbox Live Gold subscription service with a new Xbox Game Pass membership tier. Beginning on September 14th, Xbox Live Gold will become Xbox Game Pass Core, priced at $9.99 per month, the same price as Xbox Live Gold, or $60 per year. It will offer subscribers access to Xbox multiplayer gaming, a library of over 25 games, and exclusive member deals. Quote, Our launch collection of more than 25 titles from Xbox Game Studios, Bethesda, and our content partners will offer something for everyone to play on their Xbox Series S, X, or Xbox One console, said Jarrett West, Xbox's corporate VP of game marketing. Today, we're we're confirming the following titles for launch, with more to be announced in advance of September 14th. New titles will be added every will be added two to three times a year. So they announced about I think 19 games for the Xbox Game Pass core launch lineup. So we're expecting about five or six more titles to be announced as we approach that September 14th date. But of the 25 games coming to Xbox Game Pass core, players can expect at least the following to be there at launch on September 14th. Among Us, Descenders, Dishonored 2, Doom Eternal, Fable Anniversary, Fallout 4, Fallout 76, Forza Horizon 4, Gears 5, Grounded, Halo 5 Guardians, Halo Wars 2, Hellblade, Senua Sacrifice, Humans Fall, Human Fall Flat, Inside, Ori in the Will of the Wisps, Psychonauts 2, State of Decay 2, The Elder Scrolls Online, Tamriel Unlimited. Microsoft said that games with gold will continue... Microsoft said that Games with Gold will come to an end on September 1st. Players will continue to be able to access Xbox One games that they previously redeemed through Games with Gold if they remain Game Pass Core and Game Pass Ultimate subscribers. Regardless of subscription status, any Xbox 360 titles redeemed via Games with Gold in the past will be kept in the player's library. Microsoft raised Game Pass prices on July 6. The monthly price of Game Pass console subscription rose from $9.99 to $10.99, while the Xbox Game Pass Ultimate price increased from $14.99 to $16.99 per month. PC Game Pass pricing didn't change, remaining at $10 per month. So, uh, yeah, and then I wrote this down here as well, where, where Tom Warren of The Verge uh, kind of broke down in a tweet basically how all the new Game Pass tier lineups work. So with Xbox Live Gold officially dead and gone as of September 14th, the four tier subscription options for game for Xbox players will be the following. At the bottom, you got Game Pass Core, which is replacing your Xbox Live Gold. This is $10 a month. It comes with the ability to play games online, and it comes with a rotating catalog of 25 games that players will have access to, as well as different deals and things like that. The second tier, the next tier up, is $1 more. It's called Game Pass Console. This is just your regular core Game Pass. It's what we've already had. But it's ten dollars a month. It's eleven dollars a month. It comes with the Game Pass library, so hundreds of games included via Game Pass. However, it does not include multiplayer. So this is no multiplayer. Ten to eleven dollars a month. Then the next tier up, or not up, but rather the other option is just PC Game Pass in the similar price range. So it's ten dollars a month for PC Game Pass. That stays exactly the same as it's been. Just ten dollars a month Game Pass on PC. And then lastly, you have Game Pass Ultimate, which recently got a price increase to $17 a month, and it comes with hundreds of games through the Game Pass library, as well as online multiplayer access. So basically, you can the way it works is PC Game Pass stays PC Game Pass. Put that off to the side. Who cares about that? Look at the three other tiers. Game Pass Core is $10 a month. It's basically your Xbox Live replacement. It lets you play games online. And it gives you a ever rotating catalog of 25 games that you have access to, but it does not give you the Game Pass library, the full Game Pass library. Game Pass console is just your classic Game Pass. It gives you access to the Game Pass library, but it does not include online multiplayer. Game Pass Ultimate 
includes all the access to Game Pass's library as well as the online multiplayer functionality. So if there, if you want to have access to Game Pass but don't want to play games online, there's an option for you. If you want to play, if you want to play games online but don't necessarily want to have Game Pass, there's an option for you. And if you want the best of both worlds, there's an option for you. There are three choices: an option for everyone, and then also if you're a game, if you're a PC player, you got the PC Game Pass, of course. Game Pass Ultimate still includes PC Game Pass and cloud streaming and all those other features. So Ultimate includes absolutely every feature there is to have in one subscription. That doesn't change. So Ultimate, PC, same. Game Pass Console, Game Pass Core, these are where the differences come in. So I wrote a lot, I saw a lot of consternation surrounding this. First of all, I want I want, I want to, let's not separate from the noise a little too much. Let's pour one out for our boy, Xbox Live Gold, this this branding, this Xbox Live branding has been around forever. Xbox Live used to refer just to the online infrastructure and ecosystem of Xbox, and that went away about two years ago, About I think it was, where they changed Xbox Live to the Xbox Network, which is hmm, sad. And then now Xbox Live's branding is completely gone because Xbox Live Silver subscription has been has been gone for a while. That's just free. That's just the free tier of Xbox Live. That's just having an account. Gold has been the last remnant of the Xbox Live branding, which we have all known and loved for so many years since what 2004. So it's uh yeah it's it's hard to say goodbye. This has just been such an indelible and important part of the Xbox brand forever and ever and ever. Uh, but I guess the usefulness of this brand has been outlived, and now it's time to move on. So Xbox Live as a brand will officially be retired when Xbox Live Gold is replaced with Xbox Game Pass Core, which. I'm not mad about any of this. I actually think all of this is a lot cleaner and easier to market and digest and understand than what we had before. I thought it was messy having Game Pass and Xbox Live Gold. I thought it was messy having games with gold and Game Pass. So I actually think this streamlines, cleans things up, make things, makes things a lot more palatable, understandable, and easy to, easy to grasp for consumers. So personally, I think this is in that regard of just making things clean, concise, and marketable, and understandable. I think this is actually a good change. It's just sad from a sentimental point of view to say goodbye to the Xbox Live moniker uh, because, of course, you know, all of us who played Xbox forever, that's just such a huge... I don't know. It's like it's like saying... It's like if you told me, like, oh, we're still going to make Halo games, but we're renaming it. Now it's called uh, Ring Planet. It's called Artificial Ring Planet. It's like, okay, but it's like still Master Chief. It's still Halo. It's like, yeah, yeah, it's still Halo. It's just we call it Artificial Ring Planet instead of, uh, instead of Halo now. It's like, oh, okay. Well, I mean, I'm glad we still have the game, but, like, that's sad. It's end of an era, I guess. Also, end of good name naming conventions, I, I guess. But, anyway, so it's just it's just sad to see it go in that regard, but we won't dwell on that for too long. Uh, Major Nelson, Xbox Live. You guys, rest, rest in peace. Um, but, anyway, getting into the bulk of it. So, a lot of people are really confused about this. A lot of people seem a little at odds and torn apart over this. I think this is much to do about nothing. I've thought a lot about this in the days since this news has come out. And I just can't really wrap my head around why people are so confused or up in arms about what's happening here with these new, uh, with this new pricing tier con- structure, and, and 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 people are like, it costs more to not have online access than it costs to have. Yeah, man, and like people bitching and moaning about it. it's like, so if you play games on PC, you get better treatment and better value than if you play. Yeah, man, or they're like, oh, there's a there's a tax for playing games on console. It's like. I, I guess so, yeah, man. I mean, listen, man. PlayStation, Xbox, they're always going to charge you. Nintendo even does it now. They're always going to charge you to play your games on, to play their games online. It's part of how the the home console ecosystem is is monetized. It's how they, you know, it's the servers and running games online and these online infrastructures. They're not free to run and operate and maintain. Like this shit costs money. And yeah, these ten dollar a month subscription services are a lot more profit than they are routine maintenance costs. Like, they, they, they definitely turn up, you know, PlayStation, Nintendo, Xbox, these guys definitely turn a profit off these $10 a month subscription services to have access to play games online, whether it's PlayStation Plus, Nintendo Switch Online, or Xbox Live, or Xbox Game Pass Core, or whatever you want to call it. it, it it's, it's always been this way. It's not going to change. I don't see why people are up in arms about this. I think trying to trying to dig this up and act like this is problematic all of a sudden is just, it's just whiny, it's stupid, it's it's... Yeah, on, on, on PC, it works a little differently. Because on PC, it's like having a bunch of different ecosystems and consoles and, and, and environments that can run off a single platform. So yeah, I, I mean, I guess, like, 
Microsoft isn't paying for the servers when when you play, the, I don't know, fucking Command and Conquer on Steam. So yeah, I guess you don't get charged a little, you know, whatever. When you play Fortnite on the Epic Game Store, you don't get charged to play that game online. I, okay, but this is how it's always been done, and these costs are to help maintain and, and keep this online infrastructure going and operating. And you know what one of the added benefits is? Playing video games on an Xbox or a PlayStation or a Switch is a hell of a lot more streamlined, simplistic, and secure than playing games on a PC. So, I mean, you're paying for that shit. You know, that shit doesn't come free. And over time, we've seen these services evolve to give the added benefit and value to the $10 a month subscription. That's why PlayStation came up with PlayStation Plus, where they give you free games every month. And then Xbox copied it by doing games with gold. And then eventually Game Pass started offering additional features and benefits. And that's kind of how we are where we are today. It's like they, they kept saying, like, how can we add more value to these subscription services to make the player not feel like they're just burning money every every month on the blessing to be able to play the game they already purchased online. So I I mean I guess we can argue about this if we want to, but I think this is a stupid silly argument and I really don't think average consumers are going to get tripped up over this pricing structure. And I saw people bitching and moaning about like it's $10 a month to have access to online, but it's $11 a month to not have access to online. It's like, okay, bitch, calm down. Read what's happening here. These tiers make perfect sense. And and people are, I see people confused about like, who are, who are these tiers even marketed towards? It's like, I think, well, first of all, Microsoft clearly has sufficient marketing research and data to show that these tiers and these price points make sense for sizable segments of the market that actually exist and, and that these tiers and these pricing structures should attract and appeal to large swaths of different groups of people. So clearly they've done their research. These massive corporations don't just baselessly make up numbers and in, 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 in packages and say, well, I hope this works. I hope this is close enough to what the market wants. Like they have the data, the analytics, the research to back up what it is they're seeing here. So these tiers make sense. You know, maybe things do get fine tuned down the road, but these make sense. Trust me. And I'll break down what these tiers mean to me. But first, I actually want to read this. I, I, I tweeted out early in the week that I feel like these tiers make complete sense. And this is much to do about nothing to which uh, to which Jay uh, responded. Jay, listener of the podcast um, and said, uh, why have Game Pass Core at all? Why not just have two, the $10.99 option and the $16.99 versions? Is it simply so that they can offer a service that is under $10? Again, I'm no market researcher. I actually thought this was a good point. I, I do think having something to market as uh, $10 a month or $9.99 a month is, is really good from that, from that marketability standpoint of just being able to be like, Subscribe to Game Pass. Subscription starting as low as ten nine or nine ninety nine. Like I, I do think that is a uh, a commercial worthy marketing marketability kind of thing to be able to have that ten dollar a month subscription tier. And maybe that has a lot to do with why something like Game Pass Core exists. But I don't, I don't think really. I, in a lot of ways, this is like kind of just them getting their tiers in line with kind of like what PlayStation offers. PlayStation redid all of their PlayStation Plus subscription tiers a year or two ago and this kind of puts xbox's tiers a little bit in line with what they're offering so there's more parity among the competition and where what playstation does is they have like an essentials a premium and a deluxe tier or something like that i forget how they name it and do it but they have a tier that includes basically it's just like the ability to play games online and a catalog of 20 or 25 great playstation games and they're all games that are like three to six years old but they're like classic games like uncharted 4 and god of war 2018 and you know last of us and stuff like that so it's like you have this huge library you know anyway you have this huge library of games that you can access that's like oh wow i pay ten dollars a month it lets me play my game my my playstation online and i also get all these um all these really great games in case you haven't played them. And so that's kind of what Game Pass Core is doing is imitating that a little bit where it's like, this is just the subscription if you want to obviously pay the subscription to let your Xbox do the online thing and play games online. But also as the freebie, here are 25 games that we think are really great. These are core fundamental Xbox experiences that we think are going to give you great value. And some, some of these games will come in and out of the service and we'll rotate new games in from time to time. But these are a, a, a lineup of 25 really excellent games that you're going to get access to just by way of being an introductory subscriber at the $10 a month level. So I think that is way more valuable than games with gold, which is now going the way of the dodo which is excellent because games with gold we can all admit sucks i think games with gold actually absolutely does more harm to the brand than it does good because the game it's, it's been it used to be four games then it was now it's like two games 
but it sucked. Like it, it always has. It, it they're always terrible games. They're always like these no name little shitty little games that no one's ever heard of, or games that's like okay, everyone has that game at this point. It's, it's just it's never good value. I, I think it watered down the value of these subscription services because giving someone shit is worse than giving them nothing, in my opinion. So I think having a list of twenty five games that you get access to that are really good, robust games. Um, is a much better value. Saying like, hey, you can play Gears 5, you can play Halo 5, you can play Forza Horizon 4, you can play Ori in the Will of the Wisps. These are great games. I, I think having a subscription like that where it's like, oh yeah, and then maybe you'll lose Hellblade after after the first year, but then we'll add, I don't know, we'll add, um, we'll add fucking Wasteland, Wastelanders 3 or something like that. Like, th- that's, that's a good value, I think. You know, you throw in some games that are a little older, games that have been on the market for a while that you're not really making money off of anyway, but are core fundamental games that everyone who has an Xbox should have exposure to. I think that's a way better real value than deals with deals with gold or games of gold rather. So, Xbox Game Pass Core 9.99 comes with the ability to play your games online plus that 25 game catalog. I think this is a great substitute and alternative to gold. And speaking of, I just misspoke and said deals with gold, which is separate from games with gold. Uh, deals with gold is continuing. They're just renaming it deals with game pass, by the way. So that's not going away. So yeah, I mean, I think, I think that's a really great tier. And then, and the, oh, and then the option to have regular game pass for $11 a month, $1 more, but you don't get online multiplayer. The reason why this is more expensive, believe it or not, is because, uh, Having access to the expensive and expansive library of Game Pass is a way higher cost value than just the ability to play Call of Duty online or just the ability to play Gears of War online. So, yeah, that's what you're fucking paying for is you're paying for Game Pass. You're paying $10.99 a month to be able to play Starfield day one with Game Pass. That's what you're paying for. That's why it's a dollar more than the other version that includes online, even though this version does include online. So I see people people confused or upset about this. I think that's nonsense to, to be confused about that. If you don't care about having online multiplayer access, but you want to have Game Pass, I think $11 a month is a phenomenal price point. I think $11 a month to be able to play, to play Starfield Day One, to be able to play Halo Infinite's campaign, to be able to go play uh, Pentamin, Grounded, and all these games is is gr- a great deal. Obviously, it is watered down just a little bit, no doubt, because you think about a game like Exoprimal, it's like, well, you can't really play that because you don't have online access with Game Pass console tier, and Exoprimal is an online game, so there is a little bit of a lost value on Game Pass when you have a tier that includes all the games but not the ability to play online, so I get that for sure. You're not getting the full experience. You're not getting the full experience that ultimate members have but again they need an incentive to make you want to bump up to a higher tier and not everyone needs online games there are believe it or not gamers out there who just prefer single player games and so that's why i broke down this this little list this little uh kind of breakdown explaining what all these tiers are for so i put game pass core this is the tier that's ten dollars a month it comes with the ability to play games online in just a 25 plus game library but not the full game pass catalog i wrote This tier is for the person that plays Madden or Call of Duty all year long and needs access to online multiplayer, but doesn't need access to the latest and greatest games because they're pretty much stuck in their way of playing the specific games they're accustomed to playing. The core 25 games that are included with a subscription, subscription, however, may influence or entice the player to branch out, try something new, ultimately broadening their horizons and thus making them one day influenced into upgrading to like game pass ultimate where they might become a more well-rounded gamer who wants to try things outside of their comfort food, their Maddens, their FIFAs, their call of duties, their Forzas. So that is what game pass core is for. It's for the person who's like, I don't, I don't need access to all these games because I only play Fortnite and call of duty. I only play Madden and NBA. I don't need game pass because I don't want to play Outriders and fucking State of Decay. Those games don't mean anything to me. So that is who Game Pass Core is for. Or it's for the person who's like, I prefer to own my own games or I prefer to collect physical games. I don't like having digital copies of games. Great, you have an option. Game Pass Core, it's $10 a month, lets you play games online and you don't have to pay for this thing you're not using called Game Pass. So that's great. That's what that's what the core subscription tier is for, is those players, which there are plenty of. The second tier 
and this this is the one that's tripping the most people up, which I don't understand because I think this makes perfect sense. Game Pass console, which is eleven dollars a month, comes with the Game Pass library, but not online multiplayer. I said this is Game Pass console tier is clearly the single player game guy, uh, the, clearly the single player guy. This is the tier for people who don't play games online, who don't want to interface with strangers, who don't want to be competitive and get their asses kicked on a on on Overwatch or something like that. This is also a tier that's great for someone who primarily plays their video games on PC or PlayStation, but can't deny and resist the value of like an Xbox Series S with Game Pass. And so they cave and they buy Xbox Series S or something like that as a secondary console, and they subscribe to Game Pass because they want to play Starfield, they want to play Halo Infinite, they want to try out this excellent subscription service that has tons of value, but they don't need access to play games online because when they want to play games online, that's what they got PC for, or that's what they got PlayStation for, or something like, you know? So that's what the Game Pass console tier is for me. It's for the strictly single-player gamer, or it's for the Xbox is my secondary or tertiary console, not my primary. So I think that's pretty cut and clear. It's pretty obvious, and I think that makes a lot of sense. At least anecdotally speaking, since the Xbox Series generation has kicked off, you see a lot of people who say... Damn, Series S and Game Pass are a great value. I might have to pick myself up one of those just to try, you know, try it out or just to play Starfield or just, you know, whatever. So I think once we start seeing a lot of these excellent games like Avowed and Starfield and shit come out, Clockwork Revolution, I think you're going to see this become more and more common where a PlayStation fan is going to pick up the cheapest Xbox on the market and subscribe to Game Pass console because if they want to play Destiny online, they're going to do that on their PS5. But they're going to get Game Pass console because they want to play Starfield. They want to play Clockwork Revolution. They want to play South of Midnight. So that's who this tier is for. The guy that only wants to play single player or the guy that's playing Xbox as a secondary console. And now there is a subscription tier that caters to that kind of player. So more choice, more variety. That makes sense. PC Game Pass, I wrote PC here because nothing about this has changed. It makes total sense. It stayed the same. And then for the ultimate tier, again, it has stayed the same. It's just gone up in price to $17 a month instead of $15 a month. I wrote for this one. Ultimate is the tier that is aimed at real gamers, people with huge brains that play all the latest games and have robust social lives, so they need online multiplayer, but they also have a lot of really attractive women probably sliding into their social media DMs. So that is the Game Pass Ultimate tier. It's for people who need it all. People like many of us listening to this podcast, right? People who play Xbox as their primary console. People who need to play online because they want to play Halo Infinite online. People who want Game Pass because they want to play all the latest games day one on Game Pass and have the best value in gaming. People that want to use cloud streaming on their fucking Android devices when they're running around downtown Detroit or whatever the hell they're doing eating subpar pizza. People that want to be able to take Game Pass on their PC as well because it's not enough to have an Xbox Series X. You also have to have a kick-ass PC so that when those ladies sliding into your DMs come over to your place for the first time, they can say, yeah, it's liquid cool, bitch. And then, uh, you know, so that that's, that's Game Pass Ultimate, right? So... I don't know. To me, it's like it took me two seconds to think about this. I feel like it all makes perfect sense. It's a lot of bitching and moaning about nothing because, I mean, when your life is going pretty well and you don't have a whole lot of bad things happening, I guess you have time to bitch and moan about the name changes and benefits uh, included in the latest tiers of your Xbox subscription service. But I don't know. I think this is all for the better. Rotten Hell Games of Gold, you sucked. I don't miss you. I think this is a good thing that you're gone. Um, I think the core Game Pass rotational 25 games is a really good value. And I think these these four tiers are perfect for the core segments that would be interested in subscribing to an Xbox subscription service to begin with. So I think this is a great job. I think they did a really good job of uh, making sure they hit all the markets. And uh, the only thing left to say is is really... Rest in power, Xbox Live. Uh, it's going to be weird knowing that you're not around. Xbox Live is a is a brand name that... Just that fucking logo, dude. That's so cool. Like the neon light. You know, the fucking old neon light with the... X, uh, oh, dude, I just realized. I was just thinking about the Xbox Live logo. You know, it's like the Xbox with the, with the neon orange live logo underneath the Xbox name. I just realized that the Xbox Game Pass logo, that's also a green neon sign with the game, with the Xbox logo and the arrow below and the Game Pass thing. I just realized that is a continuation of the Xbox Live kind of uh, uh, logo thing with the with the neon lights. I 
that's really cool that they had that con- that continuity. I, I never put two and two together and realized that. But anyway, this was supposed to be a send off to Xbox Live. Fuck you, Game Pass, for trying to get involved. This isn't about you. You'll have your moment to shine, please. Xbox Live, thank you for being there. You're awesome. We love you. It's a name that makes me think about sitting on a uncomfortable gaming chair or beanbag while sipping on a Mountain Dew Voltage in the year 2007 playing Halo 3 and thinking, wow, my life will be so awesome when I get a 32-inch 720p TV so that I can enjoy this game in even finer definition because it's 2007 and your tiny fucking brain thinks 720p is a really, really good resolution for a gaming TV because you're dumb and you don't know any better and you'll probably never know any better. And so... Shout out to you, Xbox Live. You're the GOAT, and your mom loves you, your dad loves you, uh, even though you are adopted, so that's funny. But, um, yeah, rest rest in peace, along with uh, the not-deceased um, Major Nelson, who is departing Xbox. So, end, end of an era, dude. It's a lot we're saying goodbye to this week. Fucking Major Nelson, Game pa- or Xbox Live, and now, you know, whatever. We On to the new. We embrace the future. We keep moving forward. Uh, just like Walt Disney used to say, or or so I'm told. And uh, yeah, well, that's it. All right. I thought that was a fun way to open up the show. Talk about, or the news rather. Talk about something different, something exciting going on in the world of Xbox. And, uh, you know, not talking about courtrooms and things that I'm not qualified to speak to. But with that said, let's hightail it back on over to legal speak because we got to talk about what's going on with the Activision Microsoft deal. Although this week is much better than last week because I think we're in a point where the deal is basically kind of done and there isn't much more to say other than what the current updates are. And we can do a gut check real quick, but I don't think there's much more to worry about or say from here. So let's jump right into this. This is about six or seven stories, but I kind of pared it all down and condensed it into one mega story. So here we go uh, from VGC. Let's talk about the FTC part first, right? So this is kind of picking up where we left off last week. A U.S. court has denied the Federal Trade Commission or the FTC their request to further halt Microsoft's acquisition of Activision paving the way for the deal to finally close. We talked about that kind of last week. The deal had been basically approved. The judge had denied the FTC. And then immediately afterwards, while we were recording last week, the FTC is like, we're going to try to uh, request to uh, appeal. And then that's where we left off last week. Well, the court has decided to deny their requests and basically said, fuck you, we're done here. They can close this deal. Early in the week, the Xbox firm had won a court battle with the FTC with it seeking to block the deal over an antitrust concern. An existing temporary restraining order on the deal ends just before midnight on Friday. This is last Friday. Uh, But the FTC... But the FTC filed an emergency motion to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals asking for a temporary pause. Now the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals has denied its request for emergency relief to stop Microsoft from closing its deal under the conclusion that the FTC of the FTC's appeal. Microsoft welcomed the news on Friday saying, quote, We appreciate the Ninth Circuit's uh, swift response denying the FTC's motion to further delay the deal. While President Brad Smith said in a statement to The Verge, quote, This brings us another step closer to the finish line in this marathon of global regulatory reviews, he added. Microsoft can now close the deal after the current restraining order expires on Friday. Well, that's last Friday that they're saying that. However, they might not want to do that just yet because Microsoft still needs to resolve issues in the UK. So put a pin in that for now. We'll get back to it in a second. Microsoft wants to complete the Activision Blizzard deal, of course, before the merger expires. At the time of this writing, it was July 18th. However, at the time we're now recording this podcast, it's July 19th. So the time has passed where the agreement has to be completed by, at which point Activision had the potential or the ability to walk away from the deal, get a $3 billion termination fee from Microsoft and and say, we're done here. However, that's not what happened because as of today, as of the day I'm recording this, Microsoft and Activision Blizzard announced that they have agreed to extend their merger agreement until October 18th. So now instead of everything having to be done, wrapped up, finished by July 18th, it has now been extended yet again. So we're out of the spring and into the fall. We went from the spring to the summer to now the fall. Microsoft and Activision have agreed to extend the merger agreement until October 18th of this year, giving us a couple more months. The move to the ex- to extend the agreement came after the initial self-imposed deadline expired this week. They said, quote, together with Activision, this is Brad Smith from Microsoft, 
Together with Activision, we are announcing an extension of our merger agreement to October 18th to provide ample time to work through the final regulatory issues, basically referring to the CMA. Uh, the CMA. We will honor commitments agreed upon with the European Commission and other regulators and continue to work with the CMA on issues raised in the UK. We're confident about our prospects of getting the deal across the finish line. And Xbox boss Phil Spencer also spoke on the matter saying, quote, we're optimistic about getting this done and we're excited about bringing more games to more players everywhere, end quote. But Microsoft has a lot of work to do to ameliorate the concerns of the CMA over in the UK. Microsoft has reportedly consider considered selling some of its UK-based cloud gaming rights in a bid to gain regulatory approval for its Activision deal. According to Bloomberg sources, a company, the company said that they could sell their, ba their cloud-based marketing rights for games in the UK to a telecommunications company, gaming or internet-based computing company, or possibly a private equity firm, because you know, those are all great alternatives to uh, a big American business, right? Just give it to a big British business instead. Following the UK's competition in markets authority, the CMA, blocking the Activision deal back in April due to concerns of the impact of it, that it, it would necessitate, sorry, during to due to concerns about its impact on the nascent cloud gaming market, the regulator has now extended the deadline for its final decision on Microsoft's proposed deal. The CMA has been scheduled to deliver its ruling on the merger by July 18th. However, the CMA has uh, extended their deadline to now being August 29th. So this puts us in an interesting situation where Activision and Blizzard, sorry, Activision Blizzard and Microsoft have agreed to push their deadline to close this deal to October 18th. But the CMA has extended their deadline to figure out a new path forward and to get Microsoft to convince them to approve this deal and extended that deadline to August 29th. So even though Microsoft and Activision have until October, mid-October, the CMA is basically saying, we'll get an answer for you on whether or not we can approve this deal no later than August 29th. So it should be sooner we find out if the CMA will approve this deal, more likely when the CMA will approve this deal. However, the deal itself could still be pending and not finished until upwards of October 18th. But I would assume based on this information that if the deal gets approved by the CMA before August 29th, Microsoft and Activision will finish this merger well before October 18th. That's just probably a cushion or a little buffer that they're giving themselves, if I had to guess. Uh, anyway, the CMA says in regards to their extension, quote, the CMA consider that there's... The CMA considers that there's insufficient time remaining in this uh, statutory period for full and proper consideration of Microsoft's submission on the proposed order. As such, the inquiry group considers that there are special reasons to extend by six weeks the revised period. It will therefore be on August 29th. Uh, however, the inquiry group aims to discharge its duty as soon as possible and in advance of this date. So they are trying to get this done well before August 29th. That is just a worst case scenario is what they're saying there. During a case management conference on Monday, uh, CAT Cat provisionally agreed to a two-month stay of the case after the CMA said that it would uh, consider a modified deal put forward by Microsoft as reported by Re uh, Reuters. David Bailey, and this is the end of it, David Bailey, a lawyer representing the CMA, told the tribunal, based on the discussions to date, both sides, Microsoft and the CMA, have confidence that Microsoft will notify or Microsoft notifying a restructured transaction is capable of addressing the CMA's identified concerns. So basically it seems like the CMA and reporters and everyone involved on the ground feels very confident that Microsoft will address their concerns, fix those concerns and get themselves positioned to where the CMA will confidently and comfortably approve the deal. Basically meaning that this deal is going to get through no later than August 29th, probably sooner. And then it will be up to Microsoft and Activision to finish up their end of the signing the deals, the exchanging of the money, the shaking of the hands and all that before October 18th, which they should be able to get done well before that. So we are in the end game. The reason why, although it is frustrating that, yes, once again, this whole thing has been delayed. It's not as frustrating because we are clearly in the position now where everything's done here in the U.S. There's nothing more to worry about. Everything's done literally everywhere else in the entire fucking globe, except, of course, the British who have decided that um, uh, we are going to basically bust a nut in the U.S. courts over uh, two U.S. companies trying to merge together into one, which is... I, I, again, I want to be clear about this. 
I respect and appreciate government organizations that are trying to scrutinize this deal because I don't love the idea of huge businesses consolidating and potentially monopolizing. And I think that these these kinds of deals have negative consequences long term, potentially for consumers or for other competitors to ever even get in the market. This could be prohibitive for other competitors to ever get into the market. There's a lot of reasons why I don't love these kinds of deals and why I'm all for a government that scrutinizes and tries to break up and 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 uh, monitor and um, regulate huge corporations that are trying to do monopolistic mergers that are purely in the pursuit of profit and definitely not in the pursuit of helping gamers or helping consumers or giving consumers more options. Even if in the short term we do gain things like Call of Duty on Game Pass and the long run, Microsoft's not some beautiful altruistic company just trying to take care of all of us. This is purely for their own profits and gains and power so i i'm all for organizations like the cma and the ftc taking microsoft to task scrutinizing the deal extensively and trying to make sure that you know this this deal is okay or isn't okay so i i appreciate that i respect that but i just kind of also find it fucking hilarious that at the end of the day everything that's happened this is an american company trying to buy an american company and the only person holding it back is a bunch of fucking British people. They're pissed off because back in the day, we poured a bunch of their tea into the Boston Harbor. And now they're all salty about it. And they're like, hey, we're going to get our payback. We will. We're going to we're gonna block Microsoft from buying Call of Duty. We will. That's what you get for taking all of our tea from us. And now we all have to suffer and wait from, from April to July, from July to August, from August to October. It's all your fucking fault, you British twats. And so... Joking aside, I feel pretty good about this. I feel like we're pretty much at a point now where it's like the deal's done. It's going to happen. It's kind of on autopilot. There's not going to be too much more of the uh, salacious, juicy stories coming out from here on out. It's basically just going to be kind of like Xbox. Is, I mean, the only like big thing to look to keep an eye out on, because I suspect basically everything from here on out is going to be the deal gets approved. The deal closes. The deal's officialized. We're done here. The only other thing to look out for is what concessions Xbox or Microsoft is going to make to get this deal through the CMA and how that looks and how that's going to differentiate operations and features and things like that for the UK market or more broadly, probably for the European market, honestly, um, because the UK has decided to be uh, to make this a thing all about themselves. Um, they're going to have to make some weird kind of changes for that market in particular. It seems like so we'll, we'll have to wait and see. That'll be interesting to see how that plays out. But otherwise, um, the concerns of will this deal happen, yes or no, that seems to be laid to rest. It seems like it is happening. It's done. The uh, the ups and downs and the roller coaster ride that has been this whole ordeal for the past year and a half, it's coming to an end. It's just more a deal of um, we're waiting on these big business entities and government entities to do their thing, say their words, sign their documents, and eventually Overwatch um, fan fiction porn will be part of the Xbox first party canon. So. Take that as you will. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that's that's where we're at. I, we, we've just spoken about this so extensively over the past year and a half that I don't have much more to say about it. I, I think it's it's kind of reductive at this point for us to sit here and try to be like, this is what I like about it, this is what I don't like about it. Whatever, it's happening. At the end of the day, Xbox is going to be in a position now where they are so powerful with how many studios they have, how much first-party power and might they have that at the very least, I hope this 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 deal being marked, being completed, being done, these Activision games coming into Game Pass, et cetera, et cetera. I, I hope for, without a doubt, that beginning in 2024, we see this be the beginning of an era where Microsoft never has the Xbox has no games excuse ever again because they got Activision. Activision is consistently putting out new games every year, at the very least a brand new Call of Duty. Um, Bethesda's always putting out new shit, and they got great games between all their studios and then xbox's first party finally seems to be ramping up and firing on at least 70 percent of their cylinders so it seems like we're at a point where between all these arcs xbox's first party lineup should be very very robust and game pass should be very 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 well fed and gamers should be very 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 satiated by the amount of content the quality of content uh, just the sheer output coming from Xbox and its own entity. So 
I'm looking forward to that as, you know, that's going to happen with or without Activision, but that's going to be bolstered even further as a result of this deal going through. And so I'm looking forward to that future where my Game Pass is just the best value there is in gaming, and there's always something new and exciting to be playing, and it's not always something like Exoprimal. Sometimes it's something a little juicier like Call of Duty 2025 or fucking Elder Scrolls 69 or whatever the hell we're playing. But looking forward to it. It's happening. It's real. At the very least, I can say this. These Xbox gamers, they love they love Activision, they love Call of Duty, because look at these motherfuckers, they're playing fucking 2009's Modern Warfare 2 by the by the tens of thousands right now. The game's goddamn 15 years old. What are, you, what are you talking about? I don't even got this many people playing the Master Chief Collection. What's happening here? So there's a lot of love going out there for uh for the uh for the Activision stuff. So um the other thing we have to talk about this is uh not about the CMA, not about the FTC, but about Sony. There's one more thing we gotta say, and it's about Microsoft and Sony finally uh, doing the thing, doing the deed. Sony pulled out a, a black ink pen and signed the dotted line. So, yep, let's read this. A couple of stories stitched together here from VGC. On Sunday night this past week, Phil Spencer announced that Microsoft and PlayStation have finally signed a binding agreement to keep Call of Duty on PlayStation following the acquisition of Activision. The newly signed agreement will last for a decade, it's been claimed. This weekend, Xbox boss Phil Spencer tweeted that the binding agreement with Microsoft has been claim- as it's been claimed has been sitting ready, waiting to be signed for a number of months now, and has officially at this point been signed by Sony. Quote, we are pleased to announce that Microsoft and PlayStation have signed a binding agreement to keep COD on PlayStation following the acquisition of Activision Blizzard. We look forward to the future where players globally have more choice to play their favorite games. However, we want to be clear. Or sorry, that's the end of the quote. However, what wasn't clear in Spencer's tweet was whether this binding agreement would last forever or whether it would last the 10 years being originally proposed by Microsoft at some point or even longer. But now Axios journalist, journalist Steven Satillo has said that he's been told by Sony that the deal is indeed a 10-year deal. Quote, Sony has confirmed with me slash Axios that PlayStation's Call of Duty deal with Microsoft uh, is a $10, $10, is a 10-year deal, he tweeted. Then he joked, quote, I'm looking forward to still being in, the, in this beat in 2033 and covering the next round of Nintendo, NVIDIA, and Sony contract negotiations for Call of Duty with Xbox. When asked by a follower what what other terms and agreements were to said that no further information was forthcoming yet quote. I asked about streaming PlayStation plus access and duration. He explained, got what I shared. So he w- he didn't get any update on that. And then another thing people were mentioning is, Hey, keep in mind that this deal is about call of duty. It's not about Activision games. It's about call of duty specifically. So then that ended up with the whole conversation about how, you know, eventually we're going to see some Activision games that are Xbox exclusive that do not come to PlayStation. Just because the Call of Duty deal has been promised ad nauseum to still be on PlayStation, NVIDIA, and Nintendo. The truth of the matter is that, yeah, I mean, there could hypothetically be, I don't know, fucking Skylanders remastered or Guitar Hero 69 or fucking, what else is there? James Bonds or Tony Hawk or Spider-Man. And these games could be Xbox exclusive. And I thought about that for a second. I'm like... I don't, maybe this is true, I don't know. I don't think PlayStation has sole exclusive rights to have Spider-Man on PlayStation. I don't see why, I don't see why Microsoft couldn't make a deal with Marvel to have their own Spider-Man game because Activision has a lot of developers who've been really good at making some Spider-Man games in the past. Let's maybe get some of those guys to do, you know, Beanox or whoever to do a, another Spider-Man game. I don't know if maybe Sony's deal with Marvel includes them having sole access to the IP for video game purposes or not, but uh, I don't know. That could be something we could do. Another Activision Spider-Man game would be nice, but uh, yeah, I, I doubt that's going to happen, and I, and I assume we'll see Activision continue to operate exactly as they have operated, where... All the same teams are going to continue to do all the same things they've been doing, so mostly everyone's going to be working on Call of Duty, but, you know, boy can dream for whatever, uh, you know, whatever it's worth. But, yeah, so PlayStation has finally signed the deal, which I think that really is the most telling sign that this is happening, man. PlayStation's finally given up. Their hands are tied on the matter, and now it's time to just sit back and let it happen. So, uh, yeah, we're in, we're in the end game, as it were, at this point. There's nothing else to really say other than, this deal is going to happen. It's a matter of weeks or months, and um, pretty soon here, believe it or not, um, Alex Mason and uh, the Black Ops cast will be part of the Xbox Cinematic Universe. So maybe we can see 
uh, Woods and Mason team up with Master Chief for some crazy adventures since the Halo story doesn't even matter anymore. And why not? Let's just fucking do it. Um, but yeah, um, cool. I'm up. I'm, I'm trying to be optimistic about it. I, I don't love the idea of consolidation in the market. I don't think there's anything necessarily creative or enti- exciting about Activision now being part of the Xbox family, because at the end of the day, whatever game Activision does next, that game would have come out whether they were Xbox owned or not. So it, it, it doesn't give Xbox some, awesome brand new game we otherwise wouldn't have had you know just gives us a game we were going to get regardless but now it's on game pass so that is exciting that is cool but you know i'm more excited about some like a new game from the initiative or from uh compulsion or something like that because that's going to be a game we would not have gotten if it weren't for xbox so that's why that stuff is just so much more interesting to me however it's still pretty notable it's i mean it's the biggest story basically in gaming history of the past 10 20 years that Microsoft is buying Activision and shit's happening, man. It's, 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 it's going on. So, all right, we'll get back to that. I'm sure probably in a week or two, I'm sure we'll have some updates soon. So for now, let's move on to our wrap up stories uh, real quick. I don't have much to say about this that hasn't already been said, but we got some uh, concerning news a little bit on the fable project from VGC, Anna Miguel. Sorry, I'm butchering your name. The narrative lead on the upcoming Fable reboot at Playground Games has announced that they are leaving the project. Majel, I'll say Majel, who has worked previously on Guild Wars 2, Dishonored, and Control over at Remedy, said that on Twitter that she has had several wonderful years scribbling away at the fairy tale cottage, but the time feels right for a new challenge. Working on Fable, quote, was a dream come true for me. It was wrenching to leave it behind, but Playground has assembled a heroically talented team, so I know it's in good hands. I'm excited for what's coming next for them and for me, uh, Mijil said. Playground Games co-founder Gavin Rayburn, alongside other former members of Playground Games staff, launched Lighthouse Games earlier in the year. Lighthouse Games is a second AAA studio to be put together by former Playground staff this year. In January, it was announced that key talent behind the Forza Horizon series had left Playground to make a new AAA team called Maverick Games. After years of silence, the new trailer for Fable was shown last month at the Xbox Game Showcase. The new trailer, which claims to be running in-engine, shows the it crowd or the it crowd i don't know what the show's called because i don't know anything about the show uh richard aoti telling the game story which people seem to really enjoy that little uh that little thing the only thing i can say about this that isn't like bad news is that this game is probably far enough in development that the narrative the story is written it happened so this person's work anna's um contribution to the game is probably mostly done you know these games, these kinds of narratives and things like that are written during earlier stages of development. So while she probably would still have work to do had she stayed at uh, Playground Games, it wouldn't be a whole lot. And I assume the bulk of her job is done, that she's written her characters, she's written her stories, she's written the game's narrative, and it's off to all the other teams that are putting the game together, assembling the game, building the world, building the environments, doing the level design, all these things that you build around the narrative so i would say that if we're going to look at this from a glass half full perspective and say it's not all doom and gloom i would say she's already done with her work if anything she may be leaving because she's in a state of boredom where she's contributed what she had to contribute to the game the game got lost in development hell and now she's been kind of twiddling her thumbs waiting for a while here saying we gotta get this game out the door so we can start working on the next game to give her some work to do but because they're just working on fable you know Perhaps she has nothing to do in the meantime, and game developers don't want to sit around doing nothing. They want to get paid to do work and create games, not to sit around and let other people do stuff around them. So maybe she's moved on to go work on a new project. So I can see this that way, and in which case I wouldn't say, oh, this is doom and gloom, this is trouble for the game. But there is also the way you could read this where it's like, hmm, a narrative lead, that's a pretty fucking important person, and you're leaving them in the middle of development, and we still haven't seen a whole lot of this game, and that's not very promising especially considering a lot of people were like hey i kind of like the tone of this game but it's not quite right and so we don't know if this game requires rewrites or if this game has even really proven its narrative chops yet from what we've seen and all while we're in the process of trying to figure out how we feel about this game based on the limited amount we've seen this core member of the development team is gone so not a great look. We see this happening a lot with 343. Now we're seeing it happening a lot. Or we saw it happening a lot with the, the initiative. And we've been seeing it happen a lot this year with Playground Games, where a lot of these people are like, hey, we don't want to make an adventure RPG. We want to make racing games. Or like, hey, I already wrote my 
my narrative stuff, my narrative treatment for the game. Like I'm waiting around. You guys are still just kind of twiddling around development hell with the other aspects of the game. Hi, I'm, I'm, I'm out of here. Okay. See you guys later. So it's not necessarily doom and gloom for playground. I kind of look at it as like they're shedding, they're shedding people that don't want to make this kind of game for the most part, but they are shedding enough people to where it's like kind of concerning. It's like, what's happening? Cause let's, let's assume that everything goes best case scenario and fable is excellent. That's awesome. Will Fable be able to go back, or will, will Playground be able to go back and make another Forza game after this? Or will their studio's composition be so different that it's like, yeah, we can't make we can't make Forza anymore. So many of those Forza guys are gone. And we want to make another Fable game, but now we got to find a new narrative lead. And those are kinds of the concerns in addition to how this affects Fable directly. Is What does this mean for what Playground can do after Fable? And so, I don't know. i got a lot of questions. This is one of those games I put kind of a little bit of a question mark on. There's some games I'm really confident in. I'm really confident in Avowed, for example. Anything that anything that Obsidian's working on, I'm just I just know it's going to be good. But Fable's kind of in that camp of like I want to love it, I want to be excited. I'm a little apprehensive about where this team is and where this game's at. So we'll see. But uh, of course, wishing Anna the best in her ventures and her and her journeys. Hopefully, wherever she lands, she's happier. So yeah, shout out to that. Uh, all right, and then our final wrap-up today, guys, is uh, just some Game Pass games coming and going. So available now on Game Pass, Tectonica is a game preview that's available now on cloud, console and PC and cloud. Toem is available on cloud, console, and PC, and The Cave is now available on cloud and console. Uh, coming soon to Game Pass, Marquette is coming on July 19th to console and PC. On July 20th, uh, Figment 2, Creed Valley, and The Wandering Village are coming to cloud console and PC. And then on July 25th, Serious Sam, Siberian Mayhem is coming to cloud console and PC. Only Xbox Series, no Xbox One. Uh, and then Venba comes to console and PC, day one Game Pass title on July 31st. Finally, last, on August 1st, Celeste comes to cloud console and PC. If you have never played Celeste, for love of God, do yourself a favor and play Celeste. The game is phenomenal. And then, hey, we don't normally talk about DLC or game updates, but Sea of Thieves, the Legend of Monkey Island expansion comes to Sea of Thieves on July 20th. So the day this podcast is going live, so you can check that out. If you're looking for a big expansion to Sea of Thieves, I'm sure that will be quite compelling to fans of the game. And then lastly, leaving Game Pass on July 31st. The following games are leaving the service. service. So there's Dreamscaper. Cloud Console and PC is leaving on July 31st, as well as Expeditions Rome leaving PC. Marvel's Avengers is leaving Cloud Console and PC. The Ascent is leaving Cloud Console and PC. I really wanted to get into that game. I never did. And lastly, Two Point Campus is leaving Cloud Console and PC. I feel like that game wasn't on there for too long. Maybe it was about a year. I don't know. But uh, yeah, play them now or miss your chance forever because they're leaving on July 31st. And that is going to do it for all of our news this week. You guys, let's round out the podcast real quick with the important enough news. These are stories important enough to make the podcast, but not important enough to warn their own discussions of which we have a small handful. So shooting them off real quick. First of all, let's talk about Diablo. Uh, Activision Blizzard said on Wednesday that 10 million players have experienced Diablo 4 during its launch month. The World of Warcraft studio said it's the fastest selling title to date that they've ever launched. And Diablo 4 is releasing drove three months for the Blizzard business segment, which delivered its first $1 billion net bookings quarter. During the three month uh, period ending June 30th, Blizzard said revenue grew 160% year over year, with operating income tripling year over year, each setting new quarterly records, according to Activision. So. It's pretty safe to say people are fucking loving uh, Diablo 4. Next up, Limited Games, Limited Run Games has announced a Gex trilogy for Xbox and PC. Developed by Crystal Dynamics, the platforming game series starring the anthropomorphic gecko called Gex uh, comprised of three releases, 1995's Gex, 1998's Gex Enter the Gecko, and 1999's Gex 3, the deep, or sorry, deep cover gecko. Uh, the game's are being brought to Xbox Series S and X and Steam using Limited Run's game's Carbon Engine, a development tool that helps create emulation-based ports of classic games for modern hardware. A, re- a release window for Gex Trilogy is yet to be announced. That's going to be funny. Those games are uh, not necessarily politically correct, but I do remember playing them and enjoying them when I was a kid on the PlayStation 1, so it'll be interesting to see those games come back. Uh, Next up, VGC says South Africa's Film and Publication Board has leaked a new Borderlands collection. As spotted by Gamatsu, the ratings board has classified the Borderlands compilation Pandora's box for PC and console, and the game's origination classified, uh, which could be an unannounced title trademarked by Bandai Namco in November of 2021, so... 
it's a little bit of an odd one there. Uh, next up, People Can Fly have announced a new studio in Montreal, Canada. The studio is working on an original AAA project, which has been in development for several years at People Can Fly's New York office. Built as a highly ambitious, groundbreaking action adventure title, the project is being led by creative director Ronald, uh, Roland Lesterlin, the studio head of and studio head David Gringens. Uh, Lesterlin previously directed Just Cause 3 at Avalanche, New York, while Gringen served as the game's executive producer. Quote, Montreal's an amazing atmosphere. Well-seasoned game dev industry make the project extremely exciting for us. People Can Fly said, we believe that PCF Montreal, People Can Fly Montreal, will soon play a major role in the studio's portfolio. So they're really ramping up on something big. I'm really curious to see what that is. I like People Can Fly. I wonder if this is their Xbox exclusive game we've been hearing about. Next up, VGC says, former EA Bungie and Hongaret developers have formed a new studio. Look North World was founded by Alex Seropian, 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 uh, Jay Pe- uh, Peco, um, Patrick Moran, and Kyle Marks, Aaron Morokin, and Prashant Patil. Uh, Alex Seropian is best known for, as a founder of Bungie in the studio behind, of course, Halo and Destiny. However, he left the studio shortly after the first game came out, so he has not been there for quite a while. Uh, Jay Pe- uh, Pecho uh, has served as CTO. Aaron Marquin will be the principal artist. Um, Prashat Patil as an art director and Kyle Marks as creative director of the studio. Their first game is called Outlet corral which is being developed in unreal engine for fortnite the game is described as a wild west island featuring skill-based shootouts fortnite islands developed using unreal engine and fortnite allowed the developers to make money based on a number of players who play on that island so i didn't know you could create games within fortnite and make money off of it i guess kind of like roblox and stuff like that so that's an interesting thing for them to be doing and then finally last one vgc reports that Payday 3 will require online connection to play the game, even in single player. So speaking in a live stream, Starbreeze's global brand director, Almir Listo, confirmed that the game, which uh, offers both multiplayer and single player, will require online connection regardless of the mode you choose. When asked if the game could be played offline, Listo responded, No, you will be able you will not be able you will be able to play by yourself, but I do believe that it'll have to have a connection in order to play because it's made an Unreal Engine and the cross progression and cross play, I do believe you'll need to be online for that. So so there you go. I'm sure that will piss people off to some extent. I wonder, does that include, does, is that like a situation where you would need Game Pass Core or Game Pass Ultimate, but not Game Pass Console because you need to be connected online? Or is it because you're not playing on a server? It doesn't matter. I wonder if, if that, you know, because that, that's going to cause controversy when as games like that happen, if that's the case. So I wonder how that works, actually. But um, guys, that's going to do it for our podcast. That's actually everything this week. That's, uh, that's the last story of the week. And uh, normally we would close out with some comments, shout outs from youtube.com slash Xbox on podcast. We can click on the latest episode of the podcast, drop a comment. And I'll read it here on the show. Um, however, this week we, we really didn't get any comments. Um, and the only comments we did get, I already read them earlier in the show. So there are no comments to go through this week. So uh, I'd appreciate it. If you're interested, if you feel so inclined, leave a comment, ask a question. Tell me why I'm silly, challenge me, or just say something goofy, but drop a comment, youtube.com slash Xbox on podcast, click on the latest episode of the show and drop a comment, and then we'll read it on next week's show. I look forward to hearing from you guys, and uh, that's it it for this week's podcast. So I hope you all have a wonderful week. I hope you all take care. I hope you are all well and beautiful and happy and that your Blaze pizza comes out tasting delicious. But until next week, be well and power your dreams.